gentlemen to another edition of the wrestling underground podcast i am your host as always chad porto joining me is the glorious one himself marcus green marcus how the heck are you i'm good man so we have to start off with a little bit of uh disappointments a little, little depressing news as soon as i finish tweeting tweeting in itself is depressing But it's what we gotta do. If it wasn't for my career, I wouldn't have social media. I really don't think I would. I would just engage in stupid texts with you. <laughs> yeah, we 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 still kind of do anyway. But yep. yeah, Twitter, Twitter, it's like it's a handbag of like it's people like you that are alive, and we keep losing <laughs> better people. Yeah, and we got to talk about one of them people, uh, Shannon Spreel. Spruel? I never actually heard, heard how her real name was pronounced. Uh, the woman formerly known as Daphne has passed away. No details have come out that we are aware of, but considering the nature of how we presume she may have passed, I don't think people really want to know the details at the moment or ever. Um, it's been about four or five days, I think. When did this post uh the second oh yeah five days ago i'm a birthday sweet thanks <laughs> uh at least at least i still have keanu reeves birthday to get coincide with mine but yeah so daphne passed away um i remember watching her way back in wcw 1999 she debuted i don't know if she had any prior experience but she came in as david flair's girlfriend after I think Ric Flair got beat up and David kind of lost his mind and Crowbar was brought in, but then Crowbar was revealed to have been hired by Rick to protect David and that drove David even further. It just, it made no sense. <laughs> but that was like her first real big foray in wrestling and then um, after she got released, I think in the summer or fall of 2000, uh, she wouldn't pop up again until 2009, 2008 in TNA. And she was Dr. Stevie's assistant. And she was actually in a fun little feud with Abyss and Taylor Wilde, of all people. And it's just, it's sad. She was only 46, and, you know, it's one of those things where you wish you didn't have to see it, but you did, or maybe you didn't, and it's just, it's just hard. It's just hard to lose someone so young in this business, especially when it kind of felt like we were getting around that corner. Like, there was that time in the early to mid-2000s where everyone in their 40s in wrestling died. It just it felt like, like that time was over, but, you know, here we are. And I have nothing poignant to say, and I don't have anything that's going to fix anything. Yeah, man, I know. It's just hard, you know. I mean, a time with, you know, losing people it regularly has become a thing, obviously, because everything going on with COVID and whatnot. It's been a hell of a, it's been a hell of a two years. Uh, past two years, um, and, and you know, wrestling has uh, over that time has definitely had its losses, and this one is uh, just a you know, so it's another another sad one, and you know, it's kind of why we're always telling people uh, on here and on Twitter sometimes, just be kind to people, man, because everybody fighting something, mm-hmm. you know, uh, everybody fighting some battle or whatever you want to call it, even if you can't see it, you know. Uh, people going through stuff every day, and, and some, some fights people manage to win, and other fights, you know, get the better of them. And, uh, and all you can do is hope that, you know, they they, they find some semblance of peace, you know, where they, where they are after this this particular part of their journey. So, you know, like you said, not necessarily anything poignant, man, but, you know, just uh, if you can be a decent human being, try, you know. And if you can't be a decent human being, shut the fuck up. Um. You know, that's, that, that, that's it. That, that's all you got to do. So we do have some positive news. Uh, some, some, some good news, if you will. Uh, all Elite is, is all in popping right now. Yeah, man. They just had All Out. They had a huge show. Like, is All Out the WrestleMania? Is that their Bound for Glory? Yeah, I would imagine so, cause, cause, but all in still a thing, right? Like it's still a, 
there's all out, all in. Yeah, all out's product. I want to say all outs. Like you said, the, you know, the, the, if it's not their WrestleMania, it's definitely a uh, SummerSlam. One, one of them is one of them. <laughs> Either way, it was a hell of a show. Yeah, it was actually real solid. And, and I'm not a huge All Elite fan. You know, I, I've made that abundantly clear. Uh, Double or Nothing, All Out, Full Gear, Revolution. Revolution, Double or Nothing, All Out, Full Gear. Those are the four that they usually run. And sometimes Fighter Fest. And Fight for the Fallen. So I guess All In was just the uh, the launching show, if you will. Because that was the Cody Rhodes, um, Nick Aldis feud, if I remember correctly. was uh, All In, I think. Who knows, though? It's so long ago. Anyway, so the, hell of a show. Hell of a show. Not even an, an all elite guy. Um, I didn't watch the 10 man tag opener. It was the best friend and Jurassic Express, and that's it. They defeated the Hard Family Office. Hardy Family Office. That, that's the new. I thought they had a different name. I guess. Um, they teamed up with uh, the Hybrid 2 and Helico and Jack Evans. Was backed by the Blade. <laughs> Apparently, the best friends and Jurassic Express won that. Uh, Miro opened up the show in earnest, taking on Eddie Kingston for the AEW TNT Championship match. And I love this match. This is a great hard hitting match. I was doing some work while watching this match, and there was times when I just stopped typing and had, just stared at it because <laughs> it was so good. I, I like hoss fights, especially when they're short and violent. Any thoughts on the Miro Kingston match? Oh, it's right there with you, man. This was uh, as good old Jr. would call a slobber knocker right here. This was some, this was some good stuff, guys. Not holding back, laying in every shot as much as possible, and you know, I mean, this is what you come to expect from Kingston, man. And obviously, you know, um, Miro has been completely unleashed, as you would have it. So, you know, um, laid laid in a lot of kicks during this this fight, and uh, particularly one to the. Uh, as Taz would say, the yam bags, and uh, and it ended it with uh, I guess a matcha kick, matchka kick. So, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, man, it was a it was a hell of an opener. You know, he's definitely making his stance, defending that title, and and you know, dropping dropping dudes. And and Kingston is no easy, <laughs> no easy beat. So you know. Now I, I wonder if you would consider. Miro to be among the top in the AEW TNT all-time championship bracket. Instead, there's only like four people. <laughs> I would say like, it's, it's a bit early. It's a bit early. I feel like his run, though, has been more... I don't want to say more reminiscent of John Cena's U.S. title run, but maybe Booker T's TV title run, where it just it feels more important. Yeah, he's also he's also... Like, not waiting for competition. Like he's going, at, he's going out to field. It, it's always interesting when guys have the title and fight like they're the contender. Mm-hmm. You know, that's an interesting thing. So, yeah, it's uh, like you said, it definitely feels. But and it kind of needs to fit that way because that was a. I'm not gonna say weird, but it was a a unique. Yeah, I think is a better word. Transition when you know, obviously, with Brody Lee's passing, that was a unique transition. Uh, a period that they had to do, um, and then obviously get, getting Cody away from I think most things helps at this point. Um, but they needed somebody I think like Miro because more any, more than anything that title needs to be elevated, but you also need somebody that has something to prove. And yeah, he's it. So it really was the kind of the perfect kind of. Um collision of, of needs and wants in, in this Miro title run. Although yeah. I, I do kind of laugh that, you know, at one point you and I were very big on Cody. <laughs> now we're very big on Cody going away. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's just that it's I'm not saying like I'm, uh, you know, uh, I still like, like the guy and like, but I like him in specific instances, like certain things. Like um, you'll sleep with him, but you ain't going to marry him. 
<laughs> like you, and I went to bed with you, um, brunette, and I woke up and you were blonde. The fuck, Cody? <laughs> like, what, are you, what are we doing? And why is the dog staring at me? <laughs> <laughs> no, I am not your new daddy. Stop. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, it, it's one of those things where, like, I want to make Cody breakfast, but not for the rest of my life. Just get out. <laughs> Like, I owe you one, homie. I owe you one. Now leave. It used to be a thing, though, where Cody, I thought, was a franchise guy. And now I feel like he's more of a hanger-on than anything. And I don't know if that's fair, but I really don't think Cody is the reason, like, CM Punk came back and Daniel Bryan came back and Adam Cole signed. I think that had more to do with the way Tony Khan runs things and the deep, 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 deep pocketbook that he has. I feel it has very little to do with Cody. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. I wonder if, because probably I, I really liked his stuff with Stardust just because of the commitment. Obviously, that that, that whole thing was going to be pitching hell regardless because of where he was, but um, I always admire the commitment he put in that character both on and off screen. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel like it's one of them instances where, like, you watch a guy almost be the guy for so long, and then they become the guy like, I like you as a chaser. <laughs> I like you. You're, the, you're a perfect chaser. Like, when he's that guy, like, when he came in Impact and he was hungry um, and stuff, um, when, he, when he first left, he had something to prove. And, and I think, you know, as that guy who was, you know, not necessarily the guy, but, you know, all, always on the cusp or just constantly staying relevant enough to be always in a conversation. But then, you know, he becomes the head kahuna and it's like you're inserting yourself here and you're there. And it's like, boy, I see you. It's like, man, this is more with you. So, so it's a weird space to be in with him. I feel like he's still trying to find his groove in between being the boss and then being a consistent character on that show. Well, the good news is that we don't have to worry about Cody being the first match of CM Punk. Like Cody has been the first match for every new hire. So, yeah. thumbs up to that. Uh, next up, we had John Moxley versus Satoshi Kojima. We all love Kojima. Lariat. Lariat. <laughs> no. Oh, the Japan. Lariat. Lariat. And CM Punk's on. So, the. the, the uh, just it all works. But I will say this. I didn't think Moxley was the right choice for Kojima. I think Moxley has fallen into the post-WW trappings. He's put on some weight. Now, some of it's muscu you know, muscles. Like his, his traps have gotten bigger and his, his chest has expanded. But I feel like he's put on a little too much weight and he's starting to really slow in the ring. And... The thing with wrestling fans is, like, once you have a favorite, and I'm no different, I, I still think Sting moves as well as he ever did. I know he doesn't, but shut up. But the thing with Moxley is, I feel like the extra size has limited him, and he's no longer the worker he once was, but you, you're not going to hear a lot of people say anything about it because, oh, John Moxley jumped, and he's, you know, he, he's got the fan base and all that, but I just, I feel like with him specifically, he's lost a step, especially during his title run. I don't know if that has to do with the fact that he wasn't training as much during COVID or, or, or continues not to train much or if he's gotten into some bad habits dietarily. I don't know if that's worse. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I mean, it's interesting because I have uh, the lovely Renee Paquette. Has she uh, popped? No, no, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, because it could did. be, you know, because it could be that, uh, what do they call it, the, uh, the, the dad 15 or something? The, the sympathy uh, weight gain. Yeah, the, uh, yeah, when the dads pick up weight during the pregnancy, um, that whole thing. I mean, also he's another one too. Like I really liked his, you know, him as a character during his championship run because again he had a lot to prove, and uh, certainly had far better music. Jesus, um, come on, do you make my heart sing? I, I'm like, okay, okay, all right. Like he's, I feel like his other music fit him better, but whatever. Um, yeah, going yeah. that wild thing. It's, it's, yeah, it's not yeah. working. Well, it's, it's not working. Um, yeah, you see, he's definitely cooled off. Um, but it, it also was very weird because he was, he kind of took part of me. It's another damn U.S. belt he held hostage. Yeah. Twice <laughs> in his career now. 
Miss Korea Hill in their house. Thankfully, it's away from him now. Um, so that's not something he has to, to focus on and going back and forth internationally. Uh, ironically enough, now they're coming to him. Um, so uh, it's interesting. But, yeah, I mean, the, the match was cool. Um, I did think, I mean, it was good, but I did that. like, okay, that's that's a little short, and then obviously we're, we're going to get to why. Uh, but, yeah, they could, they, they could definitely bring the legend back. Speaking of your boy Sting, would you would you think Sting would have been a good opponent for Kojima? Oh God, no! <laughs> he was like, no, he's like Marcus, I want him to live. <laughs> You're not wrong. I get to remember Sting has a fucked neck, and he's 62. The limited amount of time he needs to be doing anything, it should either be winning a title or winning a title. I don't want any more of this fucking scripted behind the scenes fucking whatever it's called like like the whole nonsense with the um uh, the cinematic matches no no more of that either he beats kenny omega in 13 seconds in the middle of the ring or i don't care yeah i'm not, I'm not gonna lie i gotta come in them. they have done a great job at max of, of uh as a, another jr saying they have done a great job of having him maximize his minutes yeah Specifically with the holy hell, he just took his spot through the table and he's back up and doing his sting stuff. Like when the, when he's in his bag, he's in his bag and it's great. Um, but like you said, it's that prolonged thing that probably want to stay away from. So yeah. that and Kojima, specifically Kojima. <laughs> uh, yeah, and this next guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So post match, we see uh, Minoru Suzuki make his AEW debut, gets face to face with John Moxley now. If I remember correctly, this was a match that was supposed to happen in New Japan, but it never did for a variety of reasons. Now it's going to happen in Cincinnati this week. I think it's this week or next week. I'm excited. You know, Kojima can still drop bitches, so it's certainly something to tune in for. I just don't know if it's something that will be worth tuning in for at the end of the day. Because like I said, Moxie's lost a step, <clears throat> and it's mostly because of his of his weight. Like he's not as quick as he used to be, and that was a big part of his game. Like he he's not athletic. He's a brawler, but when he was a bit later in the WWE, he was quick. But now he just feels like he's prodding. Like his feet feel sluggish, and I feel like a match with Kojima is fine because Kojima is fifty one, I think. But even though Suzuki's even older. Suzuki moves quite well. So I don't know how this match is going to go, and I have my concerns. Yeah, I was going to say Ambrose, but uh, yeah, Moxley used to have this like methodical slickness to him. Mm hmm. On his shield time. Very Jake uh, the Snake esque. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, was, it was a great maniacal vibe to him. Like he, he, was, he was honed in to the stuff he was doing because it was very character driven and movement. Only thing I ever hated was that damn rebound thing he used to do. Yeah, which wasn't good. He's, like he did in this match, but it wasn't the full uh, thing. It just looked better. But um, yeah, and he's also rocking this like bald fade thing where he's balding but it's faded. Like it's it's weird. Um, we just call that a, a, a crew cop, a crew top. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. But um, and obviously he's been tagging with Kingston, so there's been that. But yeah, I mean Suzuki like. Like he's he's top five scariest guys in wrestling in the first four all Suzuki, so it's like, <laughs> so it's, uh yeah it's um it was great to see him it was even greater that the crowd like knew what it meant for him to be there, um and just the whole interaction with with Moxley is great but uh yeah we'll see because I mean the interesting thing is. We're getting all these New Japan stars over here. I mean, hell, Jay White's here. Suzuki's here. Kojima. Um, we just got Tanahashi. Um, yeah, they're all coming uh, to America. But uh, yeah, but that's. I was I was looking at something like this. Is probably one of the most pedestrian G ones apparently, in the last however many years. Um, Have so they I announced think, the list? Um. I want to say they have. I saw somebody talking about it on Twitter, but I didn't go deep into it. But uh, because of, you know everything that's going on, and they don't play about the the back and forth, like it's it's hurting stuff. And I don't think the Tongans 
even want to do G1s anymore because I don't think it's fun for them. Um, so it could be interesting to see how that lines up. But um, yeah, Suzuki and AEW, man, that's a hell of a <laughs> that's a hell of a thing. See, I I don't think Tongans ever get tired of hurting people. That's just a personal opinion. I'm glad you brought up the crowd, though. Yeah. Um, the one thing that really irked me about the uh, the whole Minoru Suzuki situation was the commentators would not shut up. Like that was oh, yeah, a, so like that. a mind-boggling thing to me. Like, if if you don't know about Suzuki and the entrance and the crowd reaction, fine. But Excalibur, of all people, should have known. And he was the one who was talking the most. Now, I think Excalibur is absolute dog shit. He's the worst announcer in, in wrestling. And, and I'm not... It, it's not one of those things where I want people to think that this is me coming for AEW. Because, honest to God, I think I would really love AEW if they had four different announcers. Like, Tony Schiavone is 68. Jim Ross is 70. Excalibur is dog shit. Like, why are they... Why? 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 <laughs> Yeah, like, like he's dog shit in dog years. <laughs> it's he, not even just dog years. He's dog shit in milk years. <sighs> like he has overstayed his welcome by twenty odd goddamn decades. Like go away, Excalibur. You are the worst play by play guy in wrestling. If Excalibur wasn't friends with Cody and company, he wouldn't have this job. He's terrible. And like, I feel like people. I feel like people don't bring it up often enough because they want to like him, and, and it's AEW, and Cody and company supports him, and the Bucks support him, so he's like, yeah, yeah. we love yeah. you, but no, he's awful. He's terrible. Yeah, like, it's, it's, not, it's not objective. It's, 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 sub, it's not subjective. It's objective. He, he just objectively yeah. sucks. Yeah, trust us. It's not personal with Chad. Anybody that's been, been a long-time fan knows he's a stickler for quality. Common take and ruin an entire show. Mm-hmm. Not going to ruin an entire We just got through talking about NWA. And they put they that was a hell of an effort on that talent's part, but that commentary I'm like they could have <laughs> they could have Thanos could have wiped him out. Uh, Joe uh, Galley, I think his name is. He's fine, um, yeah. and Tim Storm is fine, but the other dude in Madison uh, Velvet Sky was just fucking terrible. Oh, this guy was the worst, just the fucking yeah. worst. It was, it was bad, man. Um, they need to bring back Todd Patton Gale. Not Todd Patton Gale. Uh, Todd Ken- uh, Kennelly. Yeah, but w- when it comes to, to the AEW, I think a lot of people pass it because obviously JR is JR. And as long as, you know, Ski of Own does his stuff, you know, specifically, oh my God, it's day. And then obviously he's, you know, people love him and then, you know, interview and They kind of let a lot of stuff slide. But obviously it could be better. Um, and, and then Excalibur's kind of just there. And then they, they do this thing where they also rotate talent on there. So Jericho's on there is the best commentary of the week. And some other guys, I don't really see a lot of talk about Mark Henry. But, you know, he's not going to come off too stupid because it's Mark Henry. Um, and so yeah. Hen- Henry makes sense because he does Bust It Open, like the radio show. Yeah. Yeah. So he's very accustomed to being very analytical in the way he talks. But then you have Big Show, who could never cut a promo in his fucking life. Now, I don't watch AEW Dark Elevation Plus 4, or whatever the fuck it's called. I don't know anyone who does. But it's, it's just, why would you take the one dude who's more mush mouth on this planet than I am? <laughs> put him on a show and have him do commentary. I don't get it. I don't get it fucking whatsoever, but whatever. So... Yeah, we'll talk about the uh, the G one after we get through, through running through this. Um, Britt Baker defeated Chris Statlander. I could give two shits about both these two. Uh, maybe I'd give Statlander more of an opportunity if she wasn't stuck in the ring with Britt Baker. But it's just one of those things where it's like, I will never be a fan of Britt Baker, and I don't know why anyone else is. Everyone's like, well, she's a great promo and she's really good in the ring. She's not athletic. She's got terrible footwork. She doesn't do anything in the ring that no one else can do. She has nothing unique about her look. She has nothing unique about her gimmick. Oh, well, she's a doctor. No, she's a dentist. Fuck you. She cleans teeth. Come on. And, and like, if she was, like, an evil dentist and, like, overplayed it, like, super high, oh, that'd be great. But they try to, like, make it, like, oh, look how, how you know, cool she is for being a dentist, even though she's a villain. She's like, well... <laughs> What what are you doing here? Like what are you doing here? 
This makes no fucking sense. A finisher and, and a, a finisher during a time where being clean is is you know it's a mandate. Uh, you know she has to put her finger in people's mouths. Uh, right, like she could be doing the mandible claw. She could be fish hooking people. Like there's so many things you could be doing with her being an evil dentist character. But I don't know. I will say this: uh, she's on par with Madison Rain in the ring. So you can take that for what it's worth. I've made my my opinions known about Madison Rain in the ring before. So she retains. I don't give a shit. I don't even know who Jamie Hater is. Who who is that? Is, is should I know who that is? I don't know who that is. She's all elite, though. Fucking I. Uh, the women's division is shit. In uh, the most disturbing thing I've ever seen in my life, the Lucha Brothers defeated the Young Bucks in a cage match. And everyone's like, it's a match of the year. I'm like, they stood in the middle of the ring and kicked each other for 20 minutes. Why th- am I missing something here? Like, what am I not seeing that makes this match of the year? But they get bloodied, and I guess that's all it takes for, for, for some of these fans to go match of the year contender. Well you, well, you know how it is. The, the, the repetitiveness, the, 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 the blood, the, you know, pomp and circumstance of it all, the over finishers. Like, when you hitting the, when you hit, God bless Petey Williams, when you're doing a damn destroyer off the top rope. Yeah, off the top rope, thanks. Um, and I get it. I mean, it's close quarters. It's easy to kind of break up a pin. But it, it gets to a point specifically at this point for me and you. It's like, that's a finish. That's a finish. Like, I get it. Like, the finish, I get the actual finish. But, like, this this went 20 minutes over. Like, it, you know, it gets to a point where it's like, oh, my God, it's almost better than stuff like all age and impact. Like, no, no, they all aged it to death. They all aged it. Like, I'm glad Penta and Phoenix got the straps. They deserve the straps, specifically if not going break them off individually and take them to the moon like me and Chad have champion. Thankfully, we're re-watching Lucha, so eventually we'll get our wish in the past. But, yeah, it was a, it was a, I commend them for, because that's not easy to do in a closed quarter thing, the way that they did it. Um, but it's, it's not necessarily something we haven't seen before. So, but again, hype, you know. Yeah. So, the Lucha Brothers get bloodied. Fans go crazy. I'm sitting there going, meh. You know, oh, it, but, it, it, it just, it felt, it just but, felt too much. But that wasn't the part that took Chad out. No, 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 no. Like, it, it was a Young Bucks match. They, they do the same tw- six things. They're as WWE process as possible. But the moment that really had me fucking yoinked, if you will, they're over already on time, and you know they're over because Phoenix is literally telling his brother Pentagon to let's go. We have to go. Let's go. And P- Pentagon's waving to somebody in the crowd, and he's waving and he's waving, and Phoenix is already gone. And who 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 is who is the the jabroni who is with him? I don't know who that is. Doing the what? We had a red jacket on. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, a guy that I think uh, performed them out uh, because they. They had a live uh, entrance, live performed entrance. They have music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, all, all all kinds of things I didn't know about with this. So anyway, so so Jabroni and the coat and Phoenix are gone, and then you see like a little girl emerge, and it's clear that it's Pentagon's daughter. Like, and it's like, oh, okay, that's that's kind of cute, and she's crying because, you know, her father looks like a piece of ground up chuck. <laughs> He'd be crying too if I was her. And then his other daughter shows up and his wife and I, I think someone else showed up and then he hugs them all. And as he's pulling away, you can see splotches of his blood on all of their cheeks and the camera stays on them. And they are covered in their father's blood. And it was one of the most disgusting things I've ever seen. One, it's, it's bad enough to be covered in someone's blood in any situation. It's another thing to do it when they're crying because of the violence you've endured. It's not because they were so happy he won, by the way. It's because they were crying over the fact he was bleeding to death. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but there was an old MMA fight <clears throat> between Fader Emelianenko and Mark Coleman. 
And it was in the United States, I think. And Coleman got his face kicked in. Like, Fedor took no prisoners back in his, in his prime. But F- Coleman had two daughters about the same age as Pentagon. And they were bawling their eyes out seeing their father get dismantled. And so he brings them in the ring with them as they're crying. And, you know, he's trying to tell the little girls that, you know, he's okay, he's okay. And Fedor, being the champ that he is, tries to calm the girls down by letting Mark Coleman punch Fedor in the face. <laughs> see, and say it doesn't hurt. <laughs> Fedor, boss champ. But, like, that, that got so much indignation from the MMA fans. And MMA fans are pretty much one step below hardcore alt-right MAGA fans in terms of their veracity. <clears throat> so if MMA fans are saying that Mark Coleman should not have had his daughters there to watch him get mutilated, I do not know why wrestling fans, which is a far more liberal group, were docile and kosher with it. I, I, if this, is this another thing of, of AEW fans just ignoring the ick of AEW at times? Like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I, I get the sentimental great moment. It's just, it's a, it's a weird, I mean, the, the match itself was enough. And then they got the mask ripped and then it's bloody and all over that. And that's just kind of want to look away. And then, you know, you got the contact with the kids or whatever. And it's like, damn it, it's already COVID. It's like even before a virus came, it, no, <laughs> with the blood, no. <laughs> But again, man, people want their moments, man. It's just like if it was me, I like hey, hey, that. <laughs> uh, Trump and for real, like Dad, I love you. I do. I love you. I love you. You're a great guy. You're good people. You are. You're good people. But no, I don't do blood. Can't do it. And and, and you're not wrong. Like, there's a lot of possibilities that go on with that. Like all all it takes to spread any type of bloodborne illness is to inhale a little bit into your nose or get a little bit on the inside of your mouth. Right where Pentagon was hugging his kids. The stupidity that this man you know, displays on a weekly basis is, is, is obvious. <laughs> but like, damn, that was as dumb as they come. Speaking of as dumb as they come, uh, Ruby Soho debuted and people were surprised. <laughs> Now, uh, the one thing I'll say about Ruby So is I always kind of thought that she was incomplete. You know, when she was Heidi Lovelace, I was like, all right, but there's something missing. When she was Ruby Riot, I was like, okay, but there's something missing. And it was, she didn't feel authentic as Ruby Riot. And as Ruby Soho, she was very pedestrian with her look. She didn't have all the tattoos yet. Her haircut was described once to me as being that of a Muppet. And I think that's fair. <laughs> If you go back and look at her Heidi Lovelace haircut when she was in Shikara, it looked kind of like a Muppet haircut, not going to lie. But Ruby Soho has the look, the vibe, the feel. So I'm like, all right, this is peak Ruby, and I'm happy about that because she's always been a talent. Now that, I will still say the women's division in AEW is absolute garbage, and I don't care, and it's like a two-woman division, and none of them are 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 Britt Baker. Like Soho and Thunder Rose, I think, are your two best bets right now. Which is ironic, because those are the two that face off with each other. The rest have a lot of work to do on something. Um, Shido is in this match. Sky Blue, who I'm not even sure who that is. Emi Sakura, it's good to see her back. The Bunny. Talk about someone who has no real talent in the ring. The Bunny is one of the least impressive wrestlers in wrestling today. Uh, Anna J, Kira Hogan, Kylan King, Diamante... Nyla Rose, Penelope Ford, Riho is solid, but I wouldn't say uh, she's able, uh, able to hold a division up. Um, Big Swole, I think, has a lot still to prove. Uh, she's fairly new in, in the grand scheme of things. Like Thinking of some of the names that are on this roster, like the Bunny's been around for five years, right? Um, Thunder Rose has been around for a couple of years. Kira Hogan's been around for a couple of years, but Big Swole, when did she debut on, on, on the screen for AEW? 2020? Yeah, I want to say 2020 or 2019. What? Cause, yeah, I want to say it was 2019. She debuted in 2019 at the All Out Battle Royal in August. Uh, in yeah. December, she, uh, AEW officially signed her, so she started her run in 2020. So she's still fairly new to the main scene. 
Mm-hmm. Um, she does have a look. That's for sure. She does have a look. She stands out. She's got a presence about her. But I, I'd still say, even though she's 32, I would still say she's at least two or three years away from being anything worthwhile. And that's not surprising. She's only been wrestling for six years. Yeah. So I guess that time table tracks. Uh, oh, I knew that was going to fall eventually. Uh, Ty Conte, uh, Red Velvet, Layla Hirsch. I like Layla Hirsch. But Layla Hirsch, I think, needs a manager. Jade Cargill, Rubble. I take it back. Sorry, Allie. Rebels, the least, least athletic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was hard. She, and she's a one trick. Look, Rebel, you're cool. Good. Like I said, <laughs> last good people. You're great. But, good people. Um, you got amazing talents, just not in the ring. It's not, it's not in the ring. She, because she's, a, she's gimmicky now. Like she went out her way to do a stupid, unnecessary split and then got eliminated. It's like I just stop with the splits, Rebel. We get it. Um, but yeah, like you said, I think Carl Gill's got, you know, some stuff, obviously Nala Rose was there. Um, I like Red Velvet, um, Hirsch, cause that's, Hirsch is the, the, like the tiny dynamo, right? Yeah. She's the wrestler. Yeah. So she's, she's good. Um, obviously it's just cool to see Diamante wrestle cause I feel like I didn't get any of that in impact when I wanted <laughs> it. Um, so that obviously uh, it was it was cool to see. I don't know why when I heard the name Lottie Love, uh, Heidi Lovelace, I thought she would be a larger person, uh, kind of like the size of Nia Jax. I mean, I think I associated that with the name Lovelace, but um, well, she named herself yeah, was, after a porn star, so. Well, I guess some... <laughs> Marcus is googling. <laughs> In certain instances, that's right. No, I'm not going down that hole. Um, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but, yeah, I think the final three being, um, you know, our girl Thunder Rosa and then and Riot and then, obviously. Um, yeah, I mean, it was interesting because not a lot of people necessarily debuted because they could have, you know, debuted and had to come down to, like, being a runner-up, but they let her win. And, uh that's 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 gonna be interesting. But it was it was cool to see all the women um, that they have that they can actually do something with if they you know build some of these characters up. But uh, yeah, it's it's cool to see her there. You know. Uh, then we had Jericho defeating MJF by submission. I actually didn't know how this one was gonna go because wrestling has kind of returned to form with their stipulation matches that mean something. So I was thinking if Jericho was to retire, this would be it. He didn't retire. He won. <laughs> yeah. Very cool that... Because when's the last time that he beat somebody with the walls? Well, it's been a while. Yeah. So it's... You know, I thought that was unique. I thought it was hilarious that... Because in the last match, he couldn't use the Judas effect. Mm-hmm. And then I saw somebody go, like, so he just forgot to do the code breaker? <laughs> and then the irony that uh, MJ had popped it off in this match, I thought was good. A lot of a lot of storytelling officers that they integrated with this whole thing because it's been going on for months. Um, but it's also weird because they did this thing, and like you said, they're getting back to the, the, the about the stipulations with wrestling. And they had to go out of their way with this match in the fact of, like, oh, my God, his foot was on the ropes. And I guess for a lot of people, that was like a unique, great thing. But for me, it kind of, I guess, rubbed me the wrong way in the fact because it's like no other time do they go out of the way to make that a thing. Yeah, yeah. No, I I know exactly what you mean. It's that telegraphing. Like the minute they do it, you know. Yeah, the minute they do it, it's like, oh, my God, they, they beat them. It's like, and it's never a thing on weekly TV. But for this match, no. No, the, the side ref saw it, and he made, and of course, this would happen to um, the referee, of course, this would happen to would be, um, I forget her name, but... Aubrey Edwards. Yeah, Aubrey Edwards. And then it's like, oh, so now, okay, this match was so important, we needed to make that thing the thing. Okay, all right, all right, well, you know, because for me, it's like, keep that same energy. Be that diligent. Cause like let's not pretend it's not a big ass Titantron right there where you could run back the footage. 
But maybe, you know, again, the whole kayfabe of it all. So. But then you go into, why don't you do it for every match? You know, why isn't there instant replay? I thought the referee's decision was final. And, and you're right. You're 100% right. And the biggest telegraph I always talk about was John Cena being there when Mark Henry quote-unquote retired. And I even said, I, it's probably on Twitter somewhere. Mark Henry's not retiring. He's going to attack John Cena. They don't do uh, retirements this way. And then what happens? When has John Cena and Mark Henry ever been a thing, ever crossed paths? Ever? <laughs> that made no sense. So, like know. if it was John Cena and John Cena's ego, sure, yeah, John would be there to <laughs> see the retirement. But not with Mark Henry. Oh, John Cena, and after all these years, Carlito's uh, heavy that stabbed him in that night. <laughs> Jesus. Speaking of Jesus, the wrestling Jesus is back. We're talking CM Punk. He defeated Darby Allen by pinfall. The match went exactly as I expected it to. It was fine. I didn't think that they were going to have that much chemistry. I knew they weren't going to. Darby Allen's five foot seven. He's super dynamic. I wouldn't say he's overly athletic, but he's not unathletic. Punk, on the other hand, has always been a striker and a grappler, and while Styles makes fights, Darby's style is crash pad dummy. You can't make that into too many things. Like, and Punk's not big enough to be Miro imposing, right? So like, you can't do the bumping for the big guy thing. So it was only ever going to be fine, and it was, and there's nothing to complain about. I think Punk looked fine. But I think Punk's first match should have been against someone far more impressive. Because Punk was doing a lot of grappling holds, a lot of submission holds, a lot of rest holds. And yeah. that really didn't feel like Allen's game. Now, if you put him in something with like Jericho or Brian or Christian or, or even Kenny Omega, that makes more sense. But with Allen, it's like you either do the match in seven minutes or you find someone else to do the match with. And I, I, it was only ever going to be as good as it was. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm right there with you. Um, it, it was fine, but it wasn't nothing blowing out the water. But I also think, not to take away from either man, like this was a, like a considered a very solid warm up for him after seven years. Mm-hmm. Because you don't want to get him in there with somebody like you say, if it's a mirror or somebody like a, um, Kenny Omega type or a, uh, a, a Jake Hager or um, freaking MJF's heavy. Um, Warlow, there it is. You know, you don't want to gas him because he's constantly going for the go to sleep, but he can't necessarily get the guy up. Mm-hmm. Somebody like Allen, it was perfect. You know, it, it really it wouldn't stretch him like that if he was already gassed to get him up for the GT, uh, go to sleep. Um, and certainly not to look bad because, you know, Allen is he's lightweight. So, um, but he's no slouch either. So, obviously, Punk had to work. And obviously, you know, get back into the groove of his offense and whatnot. Thank God he stayed away from that top rope elbow because I put that right up there with Charlotte's moonsault. Stop. Um, it's just, it's just, it, it's not good. Um, I would love to see Punk pull out the uh, the Pepsi plunge, his top rope pedigree. Oh, yeah, that that has to suck. I, I think I watched that. That's to that has to suck. That is um, death knees right there, all death on the knees. <laughs> But ironically enough, it would have been a perfect move against Allen. Mm-hmm. Somebody like that. Um, but yeah, I wonder if he's going to uh, reintegrate the Anaconda Vice, too. But uh, that, that, was, idea. that was always one of my favorites watching him in ECW. But um, What do you think of the uh, the new trunks? I dig it. I like it. I actually like when guys uh, wear trunks because I feel like that doesn't, you know. Um, obviously, we've seen Daniels had to transition out of that. Um, yeah, he went from Chris, the bicycle shorts to the long uh, pants. Yeah, yeah, actually, like when you know, like it, it, it worked. It looked good. Um, he obviously, you know, he's not a guy that can get super huge, but he got, you know, big enough to where you know he looked good. So, um, but yeah, I dig it. I dig it. I like it. Obviously, he got some more reps to get in, but uh, I thought Allen was a good thing. Did you think? That Sting was going to drop him because I thought Sting was going to drop him because he stayed behind him a long time. I don't know if I thought that or if I was wishing that it doesn't happen. (laughs) (laughs) I'm glad it it happened the way it did because Punk needed the win and Sting didn't turn heel. So, like, that's good. Um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll say this just kind of a, as a shock. I wish more people would do the Triple H bicycle shorts. I actually thought those worked for Triple H. Oh, yeah. You talking about the, with the jeans or the ones when you had to wear them compression because his stuff was torn? The the second one, uh, in 03, when he had like that messed up thigh or like, oh, in, like groin yeah. injury or whatever it is. I actually like those. I thought those were a slick look. Yeah, that was, that was good. Ironically enough, he wouldn't have been able to wrestle if he didn't have those. So that was, yeah. Well, he couldn't wrestle before, during, or after anyway. So like, I'm not sure how that would have made a difference, but, you know, whatever. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so then we got the, uh, singles match debut of Paul White. I'll just say this. Paul White's a terrible fucking name for a wrestler. Like, it's just the worst. <laughs> it's the reason why the WWE named him the big show. I just, I just think of the, the, the hilarity of him coming to AEW and being like, no BS, because that's all this was. I'm like, how the freak did this get on the show? Like, this is the same thing. I'm like, this is like what we was talking about with the... Um, what was the match we were talking about with the, the Impact event? Was like, this could have been a pre-show match. I think it was some affiliate. I just assumed it was affiliated with Cardona. Um, well, th- I felt like this was... Uh, remember when Abyss took on Grado and Abyss stood ugh. in the middle of the ring and did nothing except like throw Grado around? That's what this match was. I, I don't know if Paul White can still go, but I do know one thing. QT Marshall never could. Like everything about QT remember, Marshall I'm, just makes me mad. Yeah, I'm sitting there doing the interest. I'm like, how long has he been in this company since the inception? I still don't know who the hell is T QT Marshall. And I don't care to know. <laughs> and whether Big Show or not, whether Big Show can still go or not, I don't care. I don't want to see him go. Go to Netflix and get your show back and do that or, or go through college. I don't want to. I don't need to see him wrestle. I don't need to see him doing the big fist and knocking people out. And, like, come on, bro. Like, why are we still doing this? You know, shockingly enough, I don't have an issue with seeing Paul White wrestle. If he can still wrestle, which, you know, there are concerns. I have concerns. But what I will say is... It needs to not be with QT Marshall because who, wh- why would I care, right? Like, that's the big thing. Why would I care about Marshall? He's awful. His entire gimmick in Ring of Honor was nobody wanted him around. And it wasn't a gimmick. Nobody wanted him around. So, I don't know. He wins in three minutes, and it, it was fine. But you're exactly right. This is one of those you you do in the main event or the opener, whatever that you would classify the main event this, of um, Rampage to be. But that's what this is for. Like, what what's what's the pre-show they do for the the buy-in? This was a buy-in thing. I would say it was a, a TV main event. I, I I think you can sell it enough with the right opponent. Like if it's like. Jericho and Big Show, or Christian Cage and Big Show, or you know Miro and Big Show. Yeah. But me, but fucking Marshall, like, like no, Q Q T Marshall for for sports analogy is to wrestling what, um, Peyton Manning's backup was to football. You never knew his name, and he didn't care. <laughs> Main event time, Kenny Omega defeated Christian Cage in a fine match. It's fine. Christian's 47. I really don't know why people are like, are you still as good as ever? He's not. He's about to turn 48. He's clearly lost two steps. Every time he takes a bump that's over a foot off the ground, I, I cringe because I'm worried about his head. But, hey, whatever. Like, it's fine. You know, I was rooting for Sting when he was 61, yeah. wanting to win titles. So, like, who am I to say Christian at 48 can't be a champion? This is interesting because Christian is like for me what like Sting and Goldberg is for Chad. <laughs> like, you can't about Goldberg. Like, you can't say something about Goldberg. Even if he concusses himself on the end. I will come like, for you. Like, nobody concusses himself better than Goldberg. But, um. If Goldberg was to accidentally kill a wrestler, I would be like, nobody can accidentally kill a wrestler like Goldberg. Fuck off. Uh, he laugh off a of murder. Um. Negligent homicide at best and i could probably get him off from that okay vince oh um. <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry did i say anything about jimmy no no i did not 
Um, but but I will say about this in Christian's defense and for your uh, acknowledgement that I am not a shitbag. Christian is, it doesn't have a style that is going to age badly. Yeah. <clears throat> he's never been athletic. Like, anytime anyone goes, oh, he's so athletic, I'm just like, huh? Like, I'm like that dog gif, like, where it's just like the dog just goes, wait, what? I, I think they do stuff like that when they when they see him come off the top rope. That's not athletic. <laughs> that's, not, that's not flying. That's falling with style. <laughs> Buzz knew what he was about. Why can't Christian? <laughs> Why can't Christian fans? It, it, was, it was a fine match, though. What, what, what did you think of it as a Christian guy? Yeah, I, I really dug it. I, I liked the, the the back and forth, the the chemistry. I liked the you know the, the last match, but I just like and and to be, I guess we going back quickly to the last thing. That was a buffer to the main event. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, the the break in the show, if you will. Um, but I I you know thought it was good. Obviously, Omega is Omega. Um, and we we constantly had a discussion like because he's the guy best in the world, whatever. But we don't know if he's the guy that he was when he was like the, the new hotness coming up in in New Japan, and to be fair, that's a whole different environment and breeds a different type of um, performer. But I dug this. Um, but just like with the Big Show match, it was a far gone conclusion because they're not gonna give him both straps. Mm-hmm. They're not gonna give him both straps, and we we know the overall narrative that's going on with you know now that you know with Callis being involved and everything. Um, Wish it wasn't still going on with the damn impact tax trap. But uh that's the you know, another story for another day. Um but yeah, I really dug the match. I liked it. I liked the attempt at the super kill switch turn into the the one wing angel, which may be the most protected finish in wrestling right now. A one of the most protected. I'm glad it is. I wish it wasn't the only one. I think every finisher should be as protected as the one wing angel. I don't care if it's a punch to the gut. That's just that's just how I feel. So nothing else happened after the show. Let's move on. <laughs> okay, so Christian gets beat up, and then Luchasaurus, I was about to call him Rascalsaurus. I don't know why. Um, Jungle Boy with his receding hairline. More like oh, Jungle man. needs to go to Keeps.com. Listen, kid. <laughs> your hairline's receding bad. Oh, man. I'm about to go to the drugstore tomorrow and buy some hair dye, I think. Because <laughs> oh, I, I, I am as gray as they can be, and I'm only 35. I've never known my hair to be this long and to have color that wasn't gray. <laughs> like, 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 like how gray? Like, like on X-Men Evolution when... <laughs> Scott and Havoc <laughs> got that power up and they went all white by the hair. Oh, God, that's right. I completely forgot they did a Havoc storyline in that. No, I would say more like uh, a darker version of Quicksilver from the X-Men movies. Mm, okay. Okay. Because, like, you know, they say the gray is a wisdom and, you know. Yeah, and listen, I get it. And, like, girls are always, like, daddy vibes. And, like, cool. I don't mind that whatsoever. But it's also, like... I'm only 35, motherfucker. I am not that close to the grave. <laughs> but yeah, so jungle nah, receding hairline boy. Oh, I'm sorry, what was that, Marcus? Are you going to fully die it or are you going to like make like salt and pepper it a little bit? I don't know. Uh, it, it's one of those things I have to wait and see. Like, I want to find something I can comb in and that won't yeah. destroy my hair. Because like, that's the problem with dyes. Like they fuck your hair up, and I'm like, ugh, I don't, I don't want to fuck my hair up. Yeah. The fact that I still have as much is, is, is a miracle. So like, yeah, you do. You are the king of the quaff, and it's interesting because I was speaking going back to that that cage match. I'm like, did the young bucks, did they get hair plugs? Because they were like, they they like it was an ongoing joke. They they were the balding bucks for a minute, and now it's like, I'm like, they either got hair plugs, or. They taking the, the what, what's the pills you take to kind of produce hair growth? Uh, forgot is it fish oil pills or something? No, I I know, I, I know there's. Uh, hang on, I know it. Hang on, it's I, it may not be a pill. Propecia, I don't know if that's a pill or like a powder you drink, but Propecia is supposed to help. Gotcha. But it, it looked like they just had like a, <laughs> like all of a sudden it's ex, exuberantly thick. 
Like the same thing happened with Jericho. I don't know if it was thinning for a minute and just came back. It, that's point not life. how hair works. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm. T- <laughs> I tried to find a way out, fellas. It didn't work. But, I don't. Um, I don't begrudge anyone for doing anything to keep their hair. Like I may joke yeah. about the hairline, but if you want to get hair plugs or, or go hey, go keeps dot com, go for it. Hey man, we look. I don't even know. I mean, obviously, I don't know if he's fully admitted, but we talk about LeBron all the time, and it it was a point to where like it moved on camera. So I don't. Um, listen, no, LeBron. He spray painted his hair, like we know <laughs> this. He went from like slight curls to like a thick, flat black mat, mat, mat. That's what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. And it's just it is like a like a fucking Romulan hair crown just came onto his head. It's like, mm-mm, mm-mm. no, you, well, you you use so glow. Even you you so glow. Even as a non-hardcore Trekkie, that works. <laughs> Romulan, you know, the Romulan, that, that is some serious. But nobody in the last 10 years, I don't think, was more egregious with it than Carlos Boozer. Oh, no, because he, he fucking painted on his beard. <laughs> his head had a black eye. Like his whole head. Oh, it, it was like he put it on his hair, and then it's like, oh no! And then it like went to his beard. I'm like, booze! What are you oh doing? My God, I'm like, dude, you went two things above shoe polish, and then just had it applied. Like what? <laughs> he went to the the, the Brea tar pitch and just lathered it on. I'm like, dude, and it's one thing if you all choose color. You're freaking <laughs> boozer's got to be biracial. Like he he's a light man. Like you know how worse it looks because of your complexion? You know how it looks worse it looks because we've seen you with hair and it's not that color? <laughs> oh, my God, man. Uh, like, there's a part of me that's still salty about Carlos Boozer leaving the Cavs the way he did. But there's also the part of me that always kind of likes him. It's like, I don't know. We're Googling Carlos Boozer with hair. Oh, God, that's right. Oh, it's as bad as it seemed. <laughs> oh, he! Oh no! It was as bad as it seemed. Marcus, it wasn't even the hair color. It was the fact that it was. It looked like, like tar. It, it, yeah, it it had a reflection. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, man! And like, listen like, again. Is... I don't begrudge him for doing it, but do it in the off season to see how it looks. <laughs> It's uh, it's a thing like it's a, it comes up in Google. Call, come on, bro, bro. What the freak is this? Hair doesn't do that. Ah, <sighs> uh, Carlos, what are you doing? Apparently, another Carlos, Carlos Beltran, did it too. Hmm. It's just it's it's really not good. And and it's it's what's even worse is and and I've talked about this with somebody else. A lot of people just don't have the head for the baldy, but he has a he has a head for a baldy. Yeah, I don't know if I have the head for the bald look. Like I got this nodule in the back of my head. I don't know if it's from taking a shot or or what, but it's like it's weird. And I don't want people to see it. <laughs> I would not I would not do well with a a uh, bald head. I would have to go Shawn Michaels, I think. And I used to have a uh, a, a Desire for the, or not a desire, but I used to regularly do a buzz cut. Because like when I was in high school, like you know, real men don't worry about hair. Because I was sixteen and trying to get laid for the first time. <laughs> so you know, I was exactly the most um, original individual. But yeah, I don't think I looked good with a buzz cut. At least I, I don't think I'd look good with a buzz cut now. But anyway, yeah. If you need hair plugs or, or a hairspray, that's fine. Just don't don't go full boozer. Never go full boozer. So anyway, <laughs> speaking of receding hairlines, Jungle Boy and Adam Cole are in the ring together. And everyone's like, yeah, it's Adam Cole. And I'm like, oh, it's Adam Cole. And Tony Khan's like, I loved his promos. And like, he scared me in, in NXT. I'm like, why? Because you thought one day he might work for you? I'd be scared too about that fact. Cole's a good promo guy. Like, that's what everyone was saying. I'm like, I've listened to his promos. 
He's not. He's very pedestrian. He doesn't. He's very unoriginal. He he looks like the dude on the end of the bar who's talking about, hey man, when I was in in, in high school, I was really good, and you know, if my coach wasn't such a prick, you know, and had played me more, I would have gone pro. Like that's that's who Cole looks like. That's who Cole sounds like. I think his <laughs> his wife might be as athletic as him. I just have no respect for Adam Cole whatsoever. Man, who's ready for story time with Adam Cole, baby? Like, it's the same stuff. Like, you can talk, but it's like, I don't know, man. Like, I, I don't, like I said, we're not taking away from people's talent at all, but it's just I these am. guys just don't. <laughs> I think Cole's garbage. Like, I have, no, I have no respect for the guy's talent. <laughs> Yeah, it's like, shame on you, shame on your cow Gargano, shame on your whole damn family with Siapa, all of you. <laughs> You're all the same guy. <laughs> they are. They are. All unoriginal, short, vanilla midgets. Apologies to the word midget. I, I know they're technically little people, but still. Yeah, it's like, Roddy, you get in there too. <laughs> yeah, and I like Roddy, but like, I liked Roddy when Roddy was original. Like, when Roddy was first in TNA, there weren't that many, you know, crew-cut, baby-faced white boys who don't speak. Like, it was him. Now there's an entire company in Orlando based around that type, and it's like, oh, so the only thing that made Roderick Strong an individual is no longer making him an individual? Gotcha. It's like if Dean Malenko was in an entire company of guys who didn't cut promos. Yeah, it'd still be great in the ring, but that mystique is gone. Like, great. Dean. You can't have a thousand Roderick Strongs. You can't have a thousand Conor McGregors. You have to have a variety, folks. Just the way it works. Anyway, so Cole comes out and joins the Elite. I didn't even know that the Elite was officially a group, but whatever. And then after Cole comes out, the Flight of the Valkyrie starts, and then it goes into some hip-hop rendition of the song, and out comes Daniel Bri- Brian Danielson with his... Um, what is that? A top knot? Is that what it's called? <laughs> His dad bun? <laughs> that was funny. Um, crowd goes nuts. Everyone freaks out. And I'm sitting there going, yeah, I don't like AEW. But this was a good show. I wouldn't say it was my favorite show. I wouldn't even say it was as good as All In, which I still think is a really damn good show. But it may have been the best All Out or best AEW show I've ever seen. I've seen all the pay-per-views at least, so I think that's, that's a fair statement. Yeah, I gotta agree, and I didn't watch the full show because at this point I'm just. <laughs> you know who to tune in for. Yeah, yeah, I, you know. The, the, shout out to YouTube, man. Those highlight packages are godsend. Um, but yeah, I watched it in the in the in the, in the super highlight thing, and uh, it was great. I enjoyed it. Um, had a way to end the show, and like you said, the crowd went nuts. And I like, you know, they they was chanting for Brian before Omega started talking. And and Punk dropped in. He was the other Brian along with Punk was the other worst kept secret. And then Punk was like, "You might want to, you know, wait. Have to wait a little bit longer." So y'all but said it. So, um, yeah, they're there, man. You know, they got they got both of them. They got them, and God knows who else is coming when they're I guess they're ninety days up or whatever. So we'll yeah, Collins getting them in there. He's uh, definitely getting them in there. So. Uh, we'll see how they do this. We talked about it, like getting these guys in there and then placement and consistency in two two different things. And they, obviously they got Rampage now. You can kind of spread stuff out, storylines and whatnot. But, you know, everybody can't beat the guy all the time, you know, so. I think they're due for another title. Um, it made sense for New Japan to have all those singles belts when they had such a deep roster. And it made sense for them to rescind some of them when they lost some of those guys. And I think you need to be able to ebb and flow with, you know, the talent size. <clears throat> and I think this is a perfect opportunity for them to introduce their own U.S. title that John Moxley can win and never defend. Just, 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 like, just, wait, whoa, just keep whoa. it even keel. Oh, oh Chad, the disrespect for the FTW. <laughs> I mean, if you want to actually make that into a belt, that's fine. But you know, if you're going to do it, do it. Don't don't tease us. <laughs> So let's talk about WWE's new big signing. Apparently, um, what is his name? Gable Stevens? Is that it? 
Gable Stevenson. Okay. The 21-year-old uh, Olympic gold medalist who just clinched his first and only gold medal at the uh, 2020 Japanese Games that happened three months ago in 2021. Fucking stupid. <laughs> I, I, I hate how they did that. Oh, it's just the worst. Um, it should have been called the 2021 Games. It, everyone would have been fine with it, whatever. Anyway, so Stevens, uh, Stevenson actually made... Uh, big splash at the Olympics market. I don't know if you know this. Uh, but he was losing the heavyweight gold medal final. And in the last three seconds, Stevenson is able to, I think it was secure a takedown that would put him over the top for the win as time expired. And it was this big deal. And now the WB has apparently signed him despite courtings from AEW, I think, um, um, UFC and Bellator, to name a few. If he did sign with the WWE, that's a mistake on his part. He'll he'll, he'll hate it. <laughs> I don't see him lasting that long in the company. Um, but if if he does like it there, you know, like this is a big get. The dude is six one two sixty five. He's big E, but more evenly distributed. <laughs> wow, that's uh, <laughs> thanks for that little picture, <laughs> bro. <laughs> Well, it's like that joke in Family Guy where Peter Griffin's not really fat. He's just, uh, he just isn't his accurate height. <laughs> but that's, that's what Big E is. Like, all of his mass is in his chest. Like, if he was, like, five or six inches taller, he, he wouldn't be so specific in size. <laughs> that's the best way to describe Gable Stevenson. Um, as a wrestler, he's good, obviously. He's a gold medalist. But he's, he didn't have the pedigree as a Brock Lesnar or a uh, Kurt Angle or a Garrison, uh, what is his name, uh, Garrison Sears, I think. I'm going to have to Google that here in a second. <clears throat> but, you know, he, he's more of a, more of an under, not, not, not an under guy. Um, he, he definitely came on out of nowhere. Like, he, he wasn't the same type of, um, type of big name heading into the Olympics. Like, there wasn't a lot of, uh, of, of hype around him. Maybe that's because of the way the Olympics went and, and the way the trials went, but he's in WWE now. Uh, he even showed up at SummerSlam. If you remember that awkward exchange where he and the other gold medalist wrestler came out and waved to the crowd. You remember that? Uh, yes, he looks like Angelo Dawkins. A little bit, yeah, only with more hair. The, the, the name I was thinking of was Kale Sanderson, not Gail Sanderson. Kale Sanderson. Um, but I digress. Uh, he, he, anytime a wrestler of this magnitude comes into a, a pro wrestling, it's something to be hyped about. You know, look at Kurt Angle, look at Brock Lesnar, look at uh, um, Chad Gable. All fantastic talents. So I have no doubt that G uh, Gable Stevenson is going to be on the same level because the skill set that you need to go from amateur wrestling to pro wrestling are very similar, and it's all about footwork. So I have no doubt that uh, Gable Stevenson is going to be yeah. good. Yeah, he reminds me of, uh, you know, like looking at him, I see a mix of, like, just aesthetic. I'm like, okay, he kind of reminds me of, uh, like you said, he looks a little bit like um, Dawkins, but he also looks a little bit like um, Jordan. Yeah, Jason Jordan. I was just uh, thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Speaking of, you know, people in, um, it's crazy. I wish that you know his story would have went differently. But uh, yeah, you know, if he can turn things even half a bit like what we got with Angle and you know Jordan in a way, uh, this guy's gonna be a problem. And and here's something that may interest you: uh, Brock Lesnar, uh, for a time, kind of took him under his wing at Minnesota because even though Lesnar lives in Canada, he's still like a very big proponent of Minnesota wrestling. He yeah. and Shelton Benjamin uh, both went to Minnesota, and um, Gable Stevenson came from Minnesota as well. I don't know if he finished or if he's leaving early to join the WB or what. But, you know, when, when you have that kind of lineage around you, that's, that's a pretty big fucking deal. Lots of guys are, uh, are putting over Gable Stevenson. So. Yeah, man, and Brock's not going to, you know, co-sign something that he thinks, is, you know, that he doesn't like because he doesn't like much, you know, so. That's true. Here's hoping we get a face Brock heel uh, Lashley f feud finally. I'd be do I'd be down for that. 
Let's talk about WWE Japan, because apparently this was the thing. Um, we had heard rumors for the longest time of WWE's uh, attempt to expand globally through the NXT brand. But apparently there was a WWE Japan as well. Now, I don't know if they're one and the same, but this is from uh, WrestleZone.com. Uh, with the entire NXT branch receiving an overhaul, it's, no surpri- it's not surprising that other dominoes would eventually fall for the black and gold brand. It's now been revealed that WB Japan, which was planned to be a division of NXT, has been dissolved. While there's little information on the subject at this time, it can't be seen as a great sign for Triple H's plan of an uh, NXT expansion across the globe in the future. The following is a translation from GameBiz.jp. Regarding WB's exit of Japan, it turns out that WB Japan GK had been dissolved yesterday. September 1st, all employees, uh, meaning investors, agreed it was revealed in the public notice of disillusion published in the government bullpen date to, dated today, September 2nd. It is a Japanese uh, corporation established by the American Professional Wrestling Organization, WWE. It was running the Japan tournament, but the WWE Live Japan schedule for July 2nd to 4th this year was canceled. That's as it was written. You have to remember it was translated from Japanese. This actually falls in line with another rumor we're seeing of the dissolution of NXT UK. Could be why Walter's on NXT now, and could be why they're uh, porting over Kylie Ray and um, Pete Dunne to NXT. There was a rumor that they've dissolved NXT UK, and that in the next month or two it'll be announced. Man, I wouldn't look. If NXT, they're two separate video games, UK getting ported over. Uh, they're getting ported over um, as an expansion pack. And it's felt like that for a while now. It's, it started off as a trickle, and now it's be like, wait a minute. I mean, shit, this is everybody. <laughs> this, is, this is everybody. And Tony Storm's on, on the, the main roster now. So... Mm-hmm. Um, and look, I, you know, people from the UK, I mean, those, those performers are second to none. But um, oftentimes, I would have to remind myself that there even was a UK side. Um, and then when it was, I got obviously hit the big shows well now. But they, it, it was getting to the point where they would use the regular NXT show to boost or even remind people about the UK show. So it's like, I just think time, man, it's just, you know. So here's a little news coming in um, from yesterday from Cultaholic.com. The creative director of NXT UK has assured fans that NXT UK will be unaffected by WD's decision to dissolve WD UK Holdings Limited, LDT, uh, LTD. Uh, initially incorporated as a private limited company in the United Kingdom in July of 2019, WD has filed for WD UK Holdings to be officially dissolved as of Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. The strike-off date for the company is listed as August 25th, 2021. Uh, the change comes amid ongoing restructuring to WWE across the globe, with the promotion reportedly dissolving WWE Japan last week, while mass department mergers have uh, occurred across the company over the past few months. Despite the dissolving NXT UK Holdings LTD, you, uh, NXT UK creative director Jim Smallman says the brand won't be affected by the changes. Responding to a fan on Instagram, Smallman said, I mean, as I'm the creative director of NXT UK, I can categorically tell you it's not shutting down. WUK Holdings is nothing to do with NXT UK. But I have to kind of point out that the um, creative director really doesn't know much, as we see every single week with Ron SmackDown. Um... Jim Smallman, if I remember correctly, is also the former founder of Progress Pro Wrestling. So there might be some na- uh, not naivety, but more denial, maybe. Because I, I, it's hard for me to understand why you would dissolve the financial aspect of the company to, to make it an independent holding group in the UK so that it could be profitable. During an era in which everything that you're doing is to be profitable, and yet you're going to allow NXT UK, which is a money pit, to continue going, despite the fact that a pandemic makes touring and and bringing talent to NXT UK nearly impossible, it makes no sense. I wouldn't be surprised if NXT UK shut down. I wouldn't. And it, it wouldn't even be a big deal, because who the fuck watches it? I don't. Marcus, do you watch it? 
I tried at first, but like I said, I think I've been keeping up mostly because they've been porting over a lot of the stuff to the regular NXT show. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, I mean, we already be having enough stuff to watch, so UK kind of just became an extra thing, ultimately. Not saying that the quality of the show was bad, but it just became, a you know, one more thing to, to watch during the week. So um, it just feels like that, like you said. If, if, if he's trying to save face or whatnot or, you know, I'm not wishing it to shut down, but if, you know, I understand saving face, but uh, it, it just feels like that because, I mean, it just had what their probably biggest match um, on a regular NXT show. You know, that was a match of the year candidate, but it, w- it wasn't on the NXT UK pay-per-view. So, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. But they, I mean, I think just tonight I saw a whole faction of the UK girls uh, um, at, at NXT. So if they not shutting down, man, they they trying to steal momentum from the NXT, the regular NXT, and that's dwindled significantly. So we'll see what happens. Only time will tell. Uh, before we go any further, uh, the New Japan block of competitors: uh, A Block for G1 is Kota Ibushi, Tomoro, Tomohiro Ishii. Toro Yano, Tetsuya Naito, Shingo Takagi, Zachary Sabre Jr., uh, Great Okan, Kenta, Tangaloa, Yujiro, Takahashi. Block B is Hiroshi Tanahashi, Kazuchika Okada, Hiroki Goto, Yoshihashi, Sanada, Taichi, your favorite wrestler, Jeff Cobb, Evil, Tamatanga, and Chase Owens. The event will run from September 18th through October 21st. I will say this, it does not feel as star-studded as years past, and I don't know if there's any talent in Japan locally that can bolster New Japan's roster at the moment. Because they, they've promoted some guys up that I don't think really are hitting home runs. Like, Evil is not a great name. Sorry. And I, as much as this is going to draw some heat, Shingo Takagi is not proven to be you know a stud in the ring with the guys in New Japan. It, it feels almost like they picked the wrong guy to be the successor to Will Ospreay, but now Will Ospreay's back, but he's wrestling in America for New Japan Strong. So, which apparently is is the better brand at the moment. So, tune in Friday night to New Japan Strong. That show's going to get real bad real fast once there's uh, fans in attendance to post spoilers. That's all Mm. I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. Um... So anyway, uh, Mark, any thoughts on that? No, like you said, I mean, it's, you know, quality names. But like you said, with no star studded, I mean, a lot of this stuff we've seen. Obviously, like I said, I heard the, the tongue I saw before about not being in the G1, but I guess they needed to. <laughs> they were there, so they kind of filled them out. Because um, obviously they, they got them split in two separate things. I mean, in the A and B block, so. We'll see. We've seen a lot of these before, man. But, you know, maybe that got something to do with the, some of the lame duck energy that, uh, you know, people are talking about around it. But, you know, the G1 has always been a G1. And even if it's on a lesser level, it's still above most things we get to see on a weekly basis over here. So. Yep. So let's uh, move on. Uh, got some impact news. Ziggy Dice is now a member of the Impact roster. I'm a fan of this. I know you're not. You're, you're not a big fan of Ziggy Dice, but this is the kind of character I think Impact desperately needs. Plus, now I'm thinking of all the fun things he can do with. Um, um, wow, what the fuck is his name? Um, Johnny. Uh, not Johnny. John Swift. Uh, <clears throat> John Swift. Yeah, that, I mean that's that's actually how you work for me. Yep. Oh, uh, not. <laughs> like, no, no, like, like, but here's how. We're going to take Ziggy Dice, we're going to strip away everything you knew about him, and we're going to put him with Violent by Design. No. <laughs> but just take him as I know him and barely like him and put him with Swinger, and then I'll accept him. That's, that, that's, that's, my, that's my re-pitch to the imaginary pitch that I just pitched. So, yeah, um, that that's interesting. And, and uh, I think they got somebody else, didn't they, Jeff? Um, Impact, uh, I don't know if they got somebody else, <clears throat> but they brought back somebody else in Jake Christ. Is that who you're referring to? Yeah. Now, was this the problematic one or was that Dave? 
That was Dave. Dave will never be seen again. <laughs> okay. Dave, Chris, David Starr, Joey Ryan, they're, they're all hanging out on the same beach of nowhere. No, Jake was, I think, unfairly cast aside with everything going on with his brother uh, at the time. The thing, the, the funny thing is, is his wife is um, Neva, who just left. <laughs> she was uh, Jessica Havoc's acting partner. Mm. Nevia. However you want to pronounce it. And Jake is looking fantastic. Uh, I always liked Jake. Jake. Jake always had a great look. His his promo skills were great. The man in black was great. The uh, the golden draw was great. Like, all this shit, his shtick with Sammy was fantastic. Now, apparently this isn't a full-time return, but there is talks of it happening and being a full-time return. But he doesn't know. I don't think Impact knows yet. We'll find out more at the next set of tapings here in a week. <laughs> But I'm 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 excited about the possibility of seeing more uh, Jake Christ because I've always liked Jake Christ. Yeah, man. I mean, um, his evolution, like you said, that was some of his best stuff with with, with Callahan and Ov, and uh, you know, he always was the one that kind of stood out more. Um, they kind of remind me when they first came in of like the SWAT cast, where one was like shorter and thicker, and then one was like lankier. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> Dave was the dark haired one. Jake was one of the platinum blonde hair. Yeah, so Jake, you know, but but Jake kind of took off, you know, like you said, he took off to the X division, was doing his thing. I damn near became king of the cutter, um, with everything he was doing. So maybe he'll get back into that. Um, but yeah, like I said, as long as he wasn't necessarily the problematic one, um, and that is ironic that his wife left. Um, but yeah, I, you know, if he can turn things around, and obviously. From what I think he said on Twitter, he's kind of had his own certain level of personal transformation. Obviously, when your brother is embroiled and uh, and all that controversy, you kind of always got to take a step back and look at yourself, you know, and see how much of it you participated in or just overlooked because it was family. So, uh, I'm um, sorry, what, what did you say, brother? Brother. Brother, 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 brother. Damn it, okay. <laughs> And they're like, oh, uh, dig it, I gave him a pass. Shut up, book. Shut up. <laughs> In my home country, we give Hulk Hogan's passes. Dig it. How how did Booker never become the next uh, guy for uh, Slim Jim? Oh, my God, man. Like, like, how did that never become a thing? Racist. <laughs> Uh, two little quick notes uh, on, on the rest of the show. Uh, we have a, a title match, finally, for Alexander Hemmerstone. He will take on, uh, the, what's his name, uh, Jacob Fatu at Fightland coming up soon. Title for title, the national openweight champion, J- Alexander Hemmerstone, versus the uh, MLW heavyweight champion in Jacob Fatu. If you've not watched MLW, tune in to Fightland. Uh, it is going to air. Let's see, MLW Fightland. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, prayers up for the Fatu family, not just with you know wanting better for you know one of the Usos, mm-hmm. but also because um, I think something happened to like what, what it was. Rikishi said his niece. Yeah, his niece. I think was kidnapped. Yeah, See, not, not, now we sound like assholes. I thought she got shot, but she may also be missing. I think she's missing. Yeah, something something happened, man. And just, you know, they, they, they put out uh, stuff on socials, man. So, you know, prayers up for that family. Because, you know, despite everything, they, that, that is a that family is very, very deep and very, you know, close-knit. So when something like that happens, it's a, you know, huge thing. It's a good thing to be as tight knit as they are. I don't ever, I, I don't know why people think being a close knit family is ever a bad thing. I know it's like some weirdos, like, you know, oh, if, if my family is not the one that I was born with, but the one I picked, and it's even better than your family. It's like, well, like if, if that's your family, that's cool, don't get me wrong, but like, I don't know why you think one is better than the other. Like, being tight knit and close with people is just, just generally a good thing, and not necessarily one that you need to brag about either, but. I'm, I'm weird. I, I'm all about the doing what what you know is good for you and leaving people alone bullshit. But you know, 
Oh, what are you going to do? I hope they find her. I hope she's okay. I hope this is one of those cases. Like, remember when Rosie O'Donnell's daughter ran away? And she was reported missing, but she'd actually just ran away to, to her, like, her 30-year-old boyfriend's house? That happened um, when I was in high school with a girl I actually uh, rode on a bus with. They put out, like, an Amber Alert for her, and apparently she just went to somebody, like, a either a family member's house or a friend's house. I'm like, man, they must have been pissed, uh, certainly as part of the family. But also, you know, they cops don't really play about those Amber Alerts. No, uh, no, so because once it, an Amber Alert goes out, uh, it becomes, like, priority one. Besides, like, yeah. a, like a, an in-your-face emergency, like a massive car wreck or something like that. But, like, yeah, so I'm yeah, hoping was, that's all this is. Yeah, same. But uh, like you said, um, along with that, you know, like you said, MLW is another, you know, I think overlooked promotion that, that puts on a lot of quality product. And certainly Jacob Fatu has been a, uh, a stronghold in that company in terms of being a quality champion. And if anybody, you know, wants a glimpse, he looks just like Umaga. Yeah, he looks like a, uh, and I, I, I don't mean this, um, like dramatically, but he's yeah. a thinner version of of Umaga. Like not dramatically so, but like if you saw Umaga in '06 and you saw this dude now, you'd be like, oh yeah, he's probably twenty odd pounds lighter, but he's still like three thirty, <laughs> and they'll still run through your head. But yeah, Hamlet, and a, and a, go on. Yeah, and, and apparently they they just signed. Um, to Jerry, I guess. Huh. To yeah. Jerry. Oh, MLW? Yeah. MLW just signed to Jerry. Oh, wow. Oh, yeah. But I was talking about uh, apparently WWE Developmental signed the Usos' youngest brother. Oh, yeah. Or young- yeah, we yeah. talked about that last week. They also signed Gable Stevenson's younger brother, too. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Or nice. older brother. <laughs> One of the two. All right. But, yeah, so that's Fightland. It was supposed to be on the 11th of September, but it got postponed. So I don't know when they rescheduled it. So, Keep tuned. Uh, last bit of rumor, though. Apparently, Kevin Owens is not long for a WWE contract. His deal is up in f- about three and a half months. Early 2022 is the rumor. And he's been tweeting out things like it's almost up. You know, uh, he tweeted out his favorite place is Mount Rushmore. He was known as a member of Mount Rushmore with Adam Cole and the Young Bucks, saying that it's almost time to go there or whatever it was. So he's dropping some heavy uh, innuendos, uh, not allegations, but heavy allusions that he's heading to AEW. Marcus, you buying Kevin Owens to AEW? I just sound like one of those PTI douchebags. <laughs> his, re- his most recent feud was with Baron Corbin. You if know? he's not serious, something's going on with him in a negative way mentally. Um he is certainly not the guy uh, in terms of character, um, momentum, anywhere near when he first came in and as the proud NXT champion, not taking L's, beating the number one star in the company definitively in John Cena. Like, I don't know what that guy is. Um, he's 37. I know you're not a big one. Yeah. yeah. And obviously he's picked up the stunner and the stunned the world is really pertinent or well, worth it. I mean, obviously, he feuded with Roman, and that was one of Roman's first things. But, but post that, it's just been, you know, hit or miss, constantly doing a KO show. Sometimes he's doing it, sometimes he's not. Oh, they're running back through Sami Zayn. That was a thing. And now he's beefing with Cord. So I'm, I'm pretty sure he's bored to death creatively, um, as I would imagine most people are. And if he tweeted something like that, I take it seriously because we've, I mean, that's been precursors for a lot of guys going over there. So mm-hmm. I don't have much to say positive about Kevin Owens. I never have. Um, I think this is one of those situations where I don't know what he has left because his knees have been shot for a while. Um, the stunner was always a bad addition. It just looks bad. It only ever looked good with Stone Cold. And it mostly looked as good as it did because he had just fucking jacked up fucking arms. So it looked re- realistic. But Owens has never been an in-shape dude. So it's like, I don't know. I just, I don't buy it. Sorry. Yeah, it's a, 
Yes. Stone Cold always had a certain pizzazz. Like the only thing that made his stunners bad was the people who didn't know how to take it. Yep. Um, so shout out to freaking, uh, freaking. I thought it looked good. I thought it looked good. I went down decent. I went. Down, I know you didn't. You went down like a dead fish. Um, but Trump's yeah, was the, great because that's who you're referencing, right? The Trump one. Yeah. That yeah. one was great because, like, he, he gets brought down and his feet go out from underneath him. So his chin drops right on his shoulder as Stone Cold's letting go. And then Trump just slides off like a fucking dead <laughs> salamander. <laughs> oh, okay, but no, nobody, nobody sold a stunner better than The Rock, though. The Rock was. <laughs> Rock could pull some Cirque du Soleil types. And, and it was great. It was I, great, I, I don't want to hear any trash about that. It was great. It was phenomenal. I just just watched compilations of it nonstop. But uh, yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of pedestrian type of deal. Um, it's kind of like when Cena start start hitting the springboard with it for some reason, and Stone goes like Jesus. If you're gonna do it, at least make it a finish. <laughs> like, I feel like he didn't want to say it looked bad, but you know, but Cena's big swole bulky self trying to do it is it, you know. So, it looked um, bad. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, I'm pretty sure he's bold creatively. And it's kind of just the thing about AEW, even with all the names that they're getting, maybe some, maybe more than they, they necessarily need, that momentum wave of, uh, you know, buy now is uh, is real. You know, you know, like I said, a lot of well, a lot of guys is just waiting for these contracts to end up. I mean, these non-competes to stop. So, you know. I don't think you're wrong. And I think in time we're gonna see uh, we're gonna see what's up. Maybe Owens is, is AEW bound. Maybe he's not. Should be interesting though. That's all I can say about that. All right. We we went way too long talking about the goddamn AEW show. So uh, anything else we get to talk about, we're gonna do it tomorrow. We'll be back. Uh, we, we did watch uh, Lucha Look Back. So, so uh, we're we're watching. We already watched Lucha Underground this week. We're gonna do our Lucha Look Back for tomorrow. Uh, I think we're on episode six or seven. It was the ladder yeah. match with uh, Mundo, Ricochet, and Big Rick. Yeah, speaking of ESPN, <laughs> got to congratulate uh, my, my good buddy Chad here. Um, as the, one of the banes of his existence on ESPN is no longer a thing. My, fuck uh, you, Kellerman. Kellerman. Fuck you. <laughs> I'm trying not to swear anymore, but fuck you. <laughs> Go toil away in the doldrums that is boxing without Jake Paul. <laughs> Uh, Max Kellerman's sport is so desperate for eyes they're bringing in Donald Trump that's all I gotta say about that for Marcus Green I'm Chad Porto this has been Wrestling Underground Podcast tune in to realnerdcorp.com every week for more podcasts follow us on Twitter at N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P follow us individually Mark is over on Twitter at Paradox Kid P-A-R-A-D-O-X-K-I-D you can also find him I'm sorry I forgot to do the the pause so you can do the that's the kid he is the kid. You can also find the kid over on the other podcast that he does, The True Penny Show, over on Twitter, at True Penny Show, T-R-U-E-P-E-N-N-Y-S-H-O-W. Follow him there. Follow me on Twitter, Chad Nerdcorp, C-H-E-D-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P, and on Instagram at Chad's photo at C-H-E-D-S-P-H-O-T-O-H-U-T. Once again, the website's realnerdcorp.com, R-E-A-L-N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P, and on the uh, Twitter at N-E-R-D-C-O-R-P. For Mark Screen, I'm Chad Porto. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for checking us out. Thanks for giving us a chance. And remember, as always, to watch more wrestling. Marcus, take us home. Good night, me. <laughs>